A dedicated group of psychiatrists, doctors, and researchers have developed effective memory fitness test platforms. There's indisputable evidence that this science can determine an individual's baseline or normal ability to form memories of recent events. Frequent testing then gives the doctors a whole new way of monitoring the patient's memory fitness. This is Dr. Wes Ashford. I'm here at the Moscone Center in San Francisco at the American Psychiatric Association meeting. We've organized a symposium for screening Alzheimer's disease. We believe this should be the sixth vital sign to add to the doctors that are evaluating patients who are elderly. But we're looking at memory problems, and memory problems, it turns out, are important for a lot of different psychiatric diseases, including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and schizophrenia. We're developing and now have available tests of memory that can be taken right on the web. Alzheimer's is in itself a $125 billion American industry. Alzheimer's is a disease of the mind, and Dr. Ashford's team is daily mining deeper into the human brain's memory mechanisms. Um, it's an interesting test, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a lot of fun to take, is what I like about it. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, you simply click on Take the Test, and then we get started. Working with Bowles Limely Technology and the Internet Broadcasting Network, doctors' offices and clinics can now connect directly to a memory testing service. Each test is unique and designed for easy administration. It is deceiving because in one minute the test generates over 250,000 pieces of information about the individual's short-term memory and learning capacity. Basically, taking a snapshot of the participant's memory fitness. <laughs> no. It really plays like a computer game fantastically. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes. Yes. I think you got those all right, Ted. Ooh. Well, there must be something wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> now, apparently, you got one wrong here, and uh, your score was 96%, which is pretty darn good but not good enough to be hired by BLT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, view your history. Taking a single test is of little clinical value. However, frequent testing eventually becomes a graphic representation of the individual's memory fitness history. The memory fitness testing platform has been integrated into an online electronic medical record management service. Literally, installing unlimited access to the memory fitness test for patients and an interactive consulting with Dr. Ashford's group for the doctors. And it's, a, it's a way that we can use this technology to um, advance in the area of uh, mental fitness monitoring. And I see that as being a tremendously exciting field that, that's going to open up uh, a whole new um, avenue of testing for a large number of people that didn't have access to this kind of testing before. Satisfied with the clinical memory testing platforms, it was agreed that public self-testing would be needed if the population was to truly benefit from the technologies. Well, uh, sometimes when I'm talking, I can't remember words that I want. Well, I have good news and bad news. I and mean, the good news is I have the same problem. The bad news is that every day we seem to get older and the problems just get worse. Healthier and happier is your following our recommendations. It's a little bit of a nuisance to take a test, but we find that the memory test that we're going to have you take, maybe every three months, is actually fun to take. And then every time you find that your memory is just as good or getting better than it ever was, you'll feel better about it. And people use this to see whether their memory is starting to fail or not. Tony and Edith became the first participants in the Alzheimer's Life Plan Memory Monitoring Public Service Project. Uh, it tells us a little bit about the test. It welcomes us. Um, in the test here, we can select the number of images that are, we're going to see in the test. And it goes anywhere from 16 images to 40 images. 
and we can also select the time between images. So in this case we'll just use what they give us, 26 images and 3 seconds between images. And now I'm going to click on the take the test and now we're all ready to go. And now the way this is going to work, Dad, is I'll start the test by pressing on the space bar and then you'll see images come up. And if you've seen that image before in the sequence, then you press the space bar within three seconds. Otherwise, uh, you just wait for the next image. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what that? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. So let's go ahead and try it. Now this you press the piece. Yeah, okay. That's good. Carl, their son-in-law, had taken a short tutorial at endalzheimers.com and learned that all he had to do was to teach Tony to depress the space bar once the test had started every time he saw an image repeat within that test. Very good, I think. 96%. Now, if you have seen those things before, that's you press them. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's <clears throat> only one that that um, was incorrect. Let's see that what it says is the. You should have said that you've seen it, and your answer was that you hadn't seen it. I'm yeah, saying. number ten. We don't know what that was. Tony and Edith are both over 80, and they have lived longer than their parents did. Until they took this test, they were genuinely concerned about memory loss and fearful that they would develop mild cognitive impairment. They enjoyed taking the test, and each took it several times, consistently scoring 100% on the 26-image, 3-second exposure test. Clearly, they have good cognitive memory and reasoning abilities. Each now has a personal memory test folder and is beginning to monitor their personal memory fitness baseline. Yeah. But anyway, it shows, you know. The important things to consider at this time as we're trying to build for the future is how we can communicate better with each other and how we can organize our systems to attack the Alzheimer process. One thing in communicating with each other to form groups, to form focus groups, where we can communicate ideas with each other, have the ideas challenged and developed and grow, find out what's right, find out what's wrong, get the best minds in the field to contribute to this, will help us lead the way to trying to determine what are the therapies, what are the interventions, what are the preventions, what are the better lifestyles that will be best for us in the future. Now, a big part of that also is communication with the people of the world that are at risk for developing this. One thing we have to do in terms of organizing systems now is trying to develop empirical tests. That means basically we have to establish research protocols where we can carefully examine all the different ideas that the scientists have come up with in populations of people who are at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease to see which treatments, which interventions, which things we do, which combinations of things that we do actually lead to preventing Alzheimer's disease. And it's, the ideas are great, the focus groups are great to come up with the ideas, but it's only going to be through studying these ideas in relatively large groups of people populations that we have systematically organized that we can find out what the treatments are that can slow Alzheimer's disease or prevent it altogether. Eventually then we will want to take these recommendations that we develop and find ways that we can get the whole population to accept them and to implement them to actually change their lives accordingly.
so that we can prevent Alzheimer's disease at the year 2012 and look back to this time and say that we did make the right decisions towards that dream.